on behalf of mansarovar global university i welcome professor tadis to see and learning and learned participants to this webinar uh, today's webinar has been organized by the mansarovar global university jointly with the national academy of sciences india bhopal chapter uh, we are greatly honored to have with us uh, professor tadis tadis to see who uh, who is uh, well known to the indian audience mostly the taxonomists and botanists uh, because of his publication uh, in the book on taxonomy which is prescribed in almost all the uh, prescribed by the uh, by all the universities in india so um, we are grateful to professor tadis to see for accepting our invitation to participate in the program uh, in fact uh, many of the participants they have met professor is to see during his visits visits to india because he visited delhi he visited uh, bagalpur university he came to pune uh, and also iopb meeting as aurangabad so uh, many of the participants who are uh, with us uh, they have met you and uh, many of uh, the participants um, they were eager to uh, listen to professor is to see Uh, professor Stussi is well known for his researches um, in the field of uh, island biology, speciation, genetic variation, evolution, and classification. Uh, he has uh, published more than sixteen books and three hundred more than three hundred uh, scientific papers, and uh, he has he is recipient of a uh, number of medals and awards. to name a few he is recipient of the engler medal in gold and also stebbins medal of the international association for plant taxonomy uh, he is recipient of the asa gray uh, medal of the american society of plant taxonomists and also uh, merit uh, award and uh, others and centennial award by the botanical society of america uh, professor Professor Stussi has been the president uh, president of the uh, American Society of Plant uh, Taxonomists, and also for a long time he was secretary general of the International Association for Plant uh, Taxonomy, and also vice president of the uh, International Botanical Congress when it was held in uh, Vienna, Austria. Uh, Professor Stussi uh, was chair. and director uh, chair of the plant biology department of the ohio state university and also uh, director of the um, herbarium and museum of the biological diversity and uh, also uh, he uh, later joined university of vienna as head of the uh, systematic botany and evolutionary uh, systematic and evolutionary botany department and also he was director of the botanic garden of the university of vienna uh, in fact my association with uh, professor uh, stc is uh, almost three decades old uh, during 1987 88 i was a postdoc uh, in his lab and uh, later on also uh, we continued our collaboration and i also visited uh, vienna for our collaborative research work um, with the, uh, this uh, brief introduction um i uh, it is a great pleasure for me to invite professor tadis tusi to share his experiences of the oceanic islands its biology and evolution and of course the ecology historical ecology of the oceanic islands to you professor tusi well arun thank you very much for that uh overly kind introduction <laughs> it's uh it's a great pleasure to to be here in columbus ohio speaking to all my friends there throughout india and this wouldn't be happening if it uh, weren't for professor pandey to make all these super arrangements so uh, arun thank you very much very kind well 
let's begin here. Let's see. Arun, I want to get rid of your face in the middle of this. <laughs> How do I do that? Sure, sure. I just want to be able to see the screen. Do I, what do I do? Share screen? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think that's. There. How's that? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Well, again, thanks for that super introduction. It's early morning here, folks. It's eight o'clock. I'm half of, half asleep, but uh, the topic is so interesting that I'm going to wake up very quickly. And I know you're very sleepy after a long, hard day, so try to stay awake there <laughs> uh, and not fall asleep during the talk too much, at least. We've been working in Oceanic Islands for more than 40 years. And a lot of interesting general concepts have developed through these studies. And the one I want to focus on today deals with the importance of historical ecology and its ability to help you interpret processes of evolution in plants of oceanic islands. Now, this could apply to animals as well, but not knowing too much about that, that aspect, my discussion will focus on the plants. Now, I think of history as being a very broad concept. I mean, in, uh, in a way, if there's time and motion in the universe, there's history. You can think about that a little bit. Now, that's a very broad definition of history. But in that context, every process in biology has a history. That is, it has a beginning, it transitions, and then finally it ends. In other words, it's historical. Now, systematics and evolution are particularly historical. I think uh, everyone understands that. Whether we're trying to understand long-term evolutionary trends, that is macroevolutionary aspects, or processes of genetic differentiation and speciation at the population level. In other words, these microevolutionary phenomena, you're really talking about historical processes. Now, when you get over into ecology, I think it's pretty obvious that ecology is also pretty significant. And this has led to a formal subfield called historical ecology that developed back in the 1970s. I mean, it's certainly not a new sort of approach, but thinking about it in a little more detail is new. And the idea is to encourage collaboration between different science areas. This is the main idea, because you're, you're trying to bring in the, the historical and the ecological, for example, such as dealing with human impacts, anthropological information with environmental aspects. You're trying to look at landscape ecology and tie it to the environmental history of areas. And all of this is to help explain changes in the geomorphology of your landscape and the vegetation that's on top of it. Now, if we take those general perspectives and now look at oceanic islands, well, there are some things to consider. First of all, oceanic islands, these are ones that come up from the sea floor. I mean, in a sense, every terrestrial part of the world is an island, but many of these are continental. Some of them are huge, of course. I'm talking here more about the oceanic islands that come up, say, off of a hot spot in the middle of, of say, the Pacific Ocean. These are relatively short-lived, and they have an ontogeny. They have a life history. They change during this ontogeny. They are, they are dynamic. In other words, they come up out of the ocean. They develop. Biodiversity develops on them. They begin to subside. They begin to erode. Diversity is, is lost, and eventually the island and the entire biota disappears under the surface of the sea and everything is extinct. This is a very dynamic system. So if you're trying to interpret processes of evolution in islands, 
you have to take into account the nature of these landscape changes during this ontogeny. And this takes place over several millions of years. I mean, an average age for an oceanic island could be about 6 million years. This can be shorter or, 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 or older. I mean, younger or older, depending on the island, obviously, and how big it is initially and so on. But they, they are relatively short-lived, at least in contrast to much larger continental regions. And in particular, if you look at the present landscape of an oceanic island now, what you see may be very different from when the populations and species originated. So if you're trying to interpret evolutionary processes, you may be misled because the ecological and spatial relationships may obscure or mislead your efforts to figure out what these processes have been. I wanna talk about these points and I hope you'll find them of interest. The points really relate to any area of the world, but our experience has been in oceanic islands and these are more natural laboratories. They're more dramatic situations. Landmass is surrounded by water. And, and if, you're, if you're in one of these islands and you look out and you don't see anything but water, but yet you're, you're sitting under having lunch under an endemic tree, for example, it just cries out for some kind of evolutionary explanation. How did they get there? How did they evolve? Our work has been primarily in the Juan Fernandez or Robinson Crusoe archipelago, but I'll mention a bit of Hawaii and also Lord Howe Island off the coast of Australia. So let me take you to the Juan Fernandez archipelago. These are Chilean islands. They form a Chilean national park down here off the coast of continental Chile at about 670 kilometers. So they're, they're isolated. There are two major islands, Robinson Crusoe Island and the associated small island Santa Clara that a million years ago was probably connected to it. And then further west, 181 kilometers is the second major island, Alejandro Selkirk. Now they're about the same size, about 50 square kilometers each. But their geological ages are, are very different. And this is a fundamental point. Robinson Crusoe Island, closest to the continent, is 4 million years old. And Alejandro Selkirk, further west, is much younger at 1 million years. Now, I, I will add a historical point here. The Juan Fernandez Archipelago was so named after the Spanish pilot Juan Fernandez, who discovered the archipelago in 1574. The term Robinson Crusoe was given to the, the islands by the Chilean government back in 1962 to help stimulate tourism. But there is a connection here. You may have read at some point in, in, in your youth the novel Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe that was first published in 1719. In 1704, there was a ship that was coming near Robinson Crusoe Island, and it had among the crew members, Alexander Selkirk, a Scottish sailor. He and the captain had a big fight and Alexander demanded to be put off at the next available land, which happened to be Robinson Crusoe Island. He stayed there in isolation for more than four years returning eventually to England, where he was quite a sensation and interviewed by many journalists at that time. Daniel Defoe got word of this and that's served as the theme for his famous book that still you can find in bookshops today. <laughs> I, I, I have no anticipation that any of my books will be in the bookstore, uh, you know, several hundred years from now, <laughs> but his is, his is still there, a remarkable, story, some say the first uh, novel in the English language. Anyway, that's, that's the tie. These two islands are attractive as most oceanic islands tend to be. On the left, we see Robinson Crusoe Island and over on the right, uh, Alejandro Selkirk Island. There are also a lot of endemic uh, species. There are 131 endemic ferns and angiosperms found only here 
giving a 64% uh, specific endemism, which was very high. There are also 11 endemic genera, and there are two endemic families, one being the fern family, Thersopteridaceae, and the other being the angiosperm family, Lactoridaceae. Now, if we're interested in aspects of historical ecology, this archipelago has some advantages. First of all, and this is true of looking at any evolutionary aspects of, of, of islands, it's a very simple island system. You've only got two principal islands. They're about, right now at least, they're about the same size. And we know their geological ages. One is four times older than the other. I mean, there are a lot of interesting archipelagos in the world. The Canary Islands are fascinating, Galapagos Islands, Hawaii, and so forth. But all these other systems are much more complicated, which means that you have many more options for hypotheses of explaining evolutionary and biogeographic uh, phenomena. The flora in the Juan Fernandez Islands is small, 152 native and endemic species, which means that if, if, you, if you work on this system for a long enough time, you might be able to synthesize something regarding the entire flora. And this, this has been our perspective for the past 40 years. Another advantage is that there were never any indigenous peoples. As far as we know, no humans lived or even visited the archipelago until Juan Fernandez, the Spanish navigator who came in 1574. After the islands were discovered, they were highly valued for stopping places for ships coming around South America, this, this terrible voyage around Cape Horn, and then before continuing further west to the Pacific for trade with the Oriental markets, they would stop in Robinson Crusoe Island and get fresh water, repair boats, allow the crew to rest up, uh, perhaps uh, get some goat meat to add to the, the diet and so forth. And so a lot of people came here and as a result, they wrote up many of these voyages. People in Europe at that time were hungry for information about the new aspects of the, of the world and profits could be made by writing books and publishing these. And another very important advantage is that more uh, recently, we have produced two modern vegetation maps for both islands. And these were done under the supervision uh, of Joseph Greimler from our department there in Vienna. First publishing the map of Robinson Crusoe Island in 2002, and then the Younger Island in 2013. I think you can see right off that there's a big difference in terms of the nature of the, of the vegetation. On the Younger Island, seen on the left, you have the vegetation in very clear zones. But over on the right, with the older island that's 4 million years old, I think you can see a lot of alteration of the, of the vegetation. The orange and yellow areas are eroded and degraded areas. And there is a lot of mixture of invasive and native elements in the flora. I'll return to these points a little bit later. Now, first, I want to comment on the natural environmental changes in the archipelago. I mean, obviously, historical ecology must take into account natural impacts and then impacts from human activities. And three of the most important in terms of the natural impacts are island subsidence, and then erosion by wind and water, and then occasionally earthquakes and tsunamis. These can be minor or not in Juan Fernandez. The latter have done great damage to the village, but have not seriously altered the vegetation. Now here's a cartoon that gives you the idea of how these islands go through an ontogeny, and they change particularly due to subsidence. An oceanic island, if it's a hot spot in origin, comes up off the bottom of the seafloor and finally pokes through the surface of the sea and the island begins. It takes a while for the various volcanic centers to, to work and then to stop and cool off. As this happens, you then begin to get 
erosion and subsidence. What's called here the post shield and erosional stage begins to show how the island is now beginning to be reduced in size from the various sides, the wave action. And also you have rainwater and wind in the terrestrial parts. And the last, uh, the last uh, picture on the lower right, the erosional and rejuvenated stage. Sometimes you do get secondary cones and so forth, but basically you can see the island is now dropping and it won't be long before this island is under the surface of the sea. An actual example is illustrated by the Hawaiian archipelago. And I want to point to the island of Oahu. Now remember the Hawaiian archipelago is one of the US states and there are mandates in each of the states that the geological survey has to be done. So there have been a lot of geological studies on these particular islands and they're instructive to take a look at this. The island of Oahu has undergone much transformation during its ontogeny and it's approximately 3 million years old. In A, you see the origin of the island from these two volcanoes that are coming up. The outline behind is the shape of the present island. So in A, you're getting the initial volcanic activity. In B, after one million years of existence, the volcano on the left side, which was the first one to come up, <clears throat> is beginning to erode and you're seeing now some of these deep amphitheater headed valleys, whereas the volcano on the right side is still more youthful. As you get to 2 million years in age, you can see you have these, these deep valleys occurring on both sides of the island now, and everything is coalesced. So you've got one island, but with two main ridges running uh, north, north and south through the, uh, through the island. And D is the situation similar to what you have today, where you've had erosion that has leveled out a lot of these uh, valleys so that you have broader valleys and the ecology has markedly changed. E shows that during the Pleistocene, there was a lowering of the sea level, which would, uh, would have added some to the shoreline, which then would have rebounded, giving the present geomorphology seen in F. So the point is, is that, is that this has been a very, very strong ontogeny and I think you can see that speciation in many of these groups <clears throat> is going to be taking place after colonization and after selection begins to do its work. And this will be surely in the one to two million years old. Probably many speciations will be occurring during the first one million years. So the context ecologically of what was present there, say in B or C, is very different from what you see in F. Now looking at Juan Fernandez, <clears throat> we have attempted to <clears throat> develop a hypothesis of geomorphological change in these two islands. And in A, you see the present island. What we think might have been the original size and shape is shown in B. The present island is about 1,000 meters tall, but we think the original island might have been up to 3,000 meters, and certainly much more surface area. I mean, if that's, if that's the case, then you would have had many more uh, ecological zones and a much more diverse vegetation than at present. Figure C shows this island after 1 million years, and here are these deep amphitheater-headed valleys, which is so typical after 1 million years. I mean, I mean these are deep, humid uh, environments, and certain species evolve into these conditions. D shows the, uh, uh, the situation after 2 million years. And you can see you're getting the valleys coalescing. The island is subsiding. You're losing surface area around the perimeter and it uh, has, has a much more uh, uh, broad and is becoming more homogeneous ecologically. And after uh, nearly 4 million years, you're getting to E, 
F is Pleistocene effects of the lowering of the sea level. And then A, of course, is back to the present. So I think you can see here, this is a, this is a pretty strong ontogeny. And if you look at the situation in A, and you look at spatial and ecological relationships of species, and you're trying to figure out how they might have evolved, you really have to think about what the situation was in C, or at most D, not really A. This is the challenge. The other island, Alejandro Selkirk Island, is the young one at one million years. It now has these deep amphitheater-headed valleys, which is what you're used to seeing for an island at that age. We, uh, we suggest that the island was a bit taller originally. It's now 1,300 meters tall. We suspect it was 2,000 originally. And it's maybe lost about 25% of its surface area. But the older island has lost about 95% of its surface area. So, so you, you know, you're, you're getting some change here during this 1 million year ontogeny. But of course, it's been much less than on the older island. Looking at the landscape, here at the top is the older island, Robinson Crusoe Island. Look at these broad valleys, you see, eroded over the 4 million years. And down below, Alejandro Selkirk Island, 1 million years, still these deep, narrow valleys. And, the, and, and I mean, these things can go down 500 meters or more. And at the bottom, it's very moist, humid. You don't get much uh, sunlight. And there you get a lot of fern uh, uh, species growing. And you've had speciation of a number of elements in this particular habitat. Mm -hmm. Now, above ground, there have been a lot of effects through rainwater and wind uh, effects. This is an example from the spring rains in Robinson Crusoe Island. You get a lot of water coming down and landslides just take out part of the vegetation. This really wouldn't be too big of a concern one way or another, except that there are now many invasive species in this island. In fact, half the flora is, is consists of these invasives and some of these are really aggressive. So what happens is that the invasive species are more competitive and they can get up into these, into these tracks and in the process go higher and higher until they get to the highest ridges of the island. Earthquakes and tsunamis have occurred in the archipelago. One historically that was very damaging, it destroyed the village, occurred on 25 February 1835. And there's a nice plate here from uh, Sutcliffe, the governor at the time, showing this uh, tsunami that came in and just took out all of the structures. This has not affected the vegetation fundamentally, but it certainly has affected the people who have lived in the island. You might have heard th about the offshore earthquake. It was a, a submarine earthquake off the coast of Chile back in February of 2010. And a tidal wave, a tsunami, got out here to San Juan Bautista, the town in Robinson Crusoe Island. And boy, it really took out about half of the town. This is before on the left and then after on the right. It took out the municipality, I mean, all the records of the village, the museum, the schools, the captain of the port, took out restaurants, the discotheque. I mean, it, it, it really knocked out an awful lot. And 11 people were killed in, in this uh, terrible, terrible event. They are rebuilding, of course. They, they, they have rebuilt a lot of this, but the sort of historical nature of the village is gone with some of these structures that have been around uh, for a long time. Now let's, let's look at these islands in a little more de uh, detail in terms of the historical ecology. And let's look at the older island because this is the one that probably has suffered more. It's been around longer. Now, first, I want to direct your attention to the western part of the island that's uh, covered by this black ellipse. This has the appearance of uh, having virtually no native vegetation left. These orange, gray, and yellow areas are eroded and look pretty much like that. 
there are some weeds in here that green up during spring rains, but there is nothing native left. Well, going to the historical record, and there are more than 70 um, historical records of human activities, you know, visits and activities during these visits from various captains, pilots, or other visitors to the archipelago. Here is one from Cook in 1712. And of course, it's very, very simple graphic, but you can see that there are symbols of trees on the lower park. This is not oriented correctly north-south, but the eastern part of the island, which is shown below, was apparently covered by trees, as at least shown in this diagram. And up toward the other end, which is really the western part of the island, it has a goat on it, <laughs> or two goats. That was without trees, even from the early visits. Or here's another one. This is also oriented the same way. But that western part of the island from Billion in 1764 is shown as, as a sterile desert land. So I think we can conclude that this western area was not an area that was devastated by human activity. This is an area that was naturally lowered through subsidence and erosion, and the forests just disappeared. There were probably forests all over the place originally when the island was much larger. But by the time people began to visit, this was just gone. And so humans didn't really have anything to do with loss of vegetation in the western part of the island. Now let's look at the eastern part of the island. There are uh, uh, four circle areas that indicate four different uh, uh, places where ships anchored. They're called ports. The central one that has the biggest notch is Cumberland Bay. And right next to that, I mean, along the shore, is the only village, San Juan Bautista, in other words, St. John the Baptist. This little village has ranged from about 500 to 900 people throughout its existence, and it was founded in 1750. Other ships have come and anchored, and they've done that at these other ports. Toward the lower right, it's the French port, Port de Francaise, and then going up toward the other side, you have Puerto Ingles and then La Bacaria. And La Bacaria simply refers to a place of holding cows or like a corral of cows, which in fact it was used to, uh, to do. You can see in these four circle areas, there's a lot of disturbance to the vegetation, a lot of yellow and orange areas, which uh, indicates uh, substantial human impact. Now I want to emphasize again that human activities, however strong they have been in this archipelago, only began in 1574, which is when the islands were discovered by the Spanish navigator Juan Fernandez. And the, the, there's sort of an interesting story on that. Ships that were going from Callao in Peru, that's the port of Lima, south to Chile, would go along the coast, south along the coast, and to do that, they were fighting the Humboldt current flowing north. And it took them forever to get down there, like three months or more. For some reason, Juan Fernandez first went further west and then turned south. As he did that, it, it, it put him on a trajectory right by Robinson Crusoe Island. But more importantly, he got down to Chile in, in three weeks. <laughs> and this was so fast that the Inquisition got hold of him and said, oh, the only way anybody could do this was is with the help of the devil. And he was thrown in jail for a while. And he was only then released when other navigators caught on to this and duplicated the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, same trip. Well, a number of human impacts on the vegetation have been, first of all, just cutting of the forests. Forests basically for lumber, to repair ships, to build uh, buildings, and of course, for firewood. People have introduced uh, domesticated animals and plants, and a number of these animals in particular have escaped, become feral into the native forest, and done a lot of damage. 
plants have been introduced sometimes for decoration, sometimes for food, and some of these have become very invasive. Some have been introduced inadvertently, and there's also been fire. Let me explain some of these points. Now again, it's great that there, there were no indigenous peoples and also great there have been a lot of historical reports covering these more than 400 years. I, I recently brought these together in a new book called Environmental History of Oceanic Islands, The Natural and Human Impacts on the Vegetation of the Juan Fernandez Archipelago, just published a few months ago. And in this book, I've broken down these historical periods that separates out the information that we have during each of these, uh, these major phases, starting with the discovery and early exploration, then the colonial period, the early botanical period, floristic period, the Carl Scottsberg uh, phase by himself because he, uh, he was a Swedish botanist from Göteborg, Sweden, who made major contributions to understanding the flora and the vegetation. Now the touristic period and the modern period. So, I mean, the point is there's a lot of historical information. For example, some of the historical texts show evidence of original extensive forests along this northeastern portion of Robinson Crusoe Island. Dampier in 1684 comments on the sides of the mountains that are part savanna, part woodland. So there were some grassy areas apparently. Or Schilvach in 1720, the woods which cover the island. Or Anson in 1741, the northern part of this island is generally covered with trees. So you get these sorts of comments suggesting that you really had a lot of forest along the northeastern side of the island. And there are sketches that also suggest this. Here is one from 1680, the English privateer Basil Ringrose. And you can see that there are symbols along the eastern side of the, uh, of the drawing. Now, this is not the most precise drawing in the world, that's for sure. But he does show these four major bays, False Bay, which we call Puerto Frances now, Windy Bay, which is uh, uh, Bahia Cumberland, then Captain Sharps Bay, this is uh, Puerto Inglés, and then at the top is La Bacaria. So in other words, it's not too inaccurate. And there are the symbols of the trees but only on the eastern side of the island. Now, a more precise observer, and he was also there for many months, was Lord George Anson, who visited Robinson Crusoe Island in 1741. And here is a plate from his publication in 1748. And you can see pretty clearly, I think, from where you are, that there are these symbols of trees all along this northern part of the island. But out in the west, which is the low eroded area, it says barren land. So again, another documentation of that. And if you look at this blow up here, right in the lower uh, right hand side, you can see all these tree symbols. In other words, this shows forests extending to the sea just everywhere along the northern part of the island. And he also offered this graphic of his campsite where you can see the trees, they're called the laurel trees, which is no doubt Nothomircia fernandesiana. It's an endemic species in the island and it is, it's the dominant forest tree. This area was probably cleared by other visitors before, but I think you get the impression that these trees, no doubt earlier, <laughs> extended all the way to the, to the shore. <clears throat> now, when you get into the middle of the 19th century, such as the visit by Claudio Gay, published in 1854, you can, you can see that a lot of these trees in the Central Valley associated with a village have been taken out. And you have a few houses and so, but uh, there just isn't, isn't too much left in this area. You can also see these caves over to the center left. These were used to house criminals that were exiled to the island. And they were also used to house exile, a political exiles during the War of Independence. They still exist. And you can see them even now because they're a tourist attraction. I think in the center, you can see a few of these caves that are left. 
Well, this Central Valley has been reforested. This is a more recent photo. But what you see are introduced species of Pinus, Pinus radiata, Cupressus sempervirens, and Eucal uh, Eucalyptus globalis. And the, this is perhaps not a bad solution because they're holding the soil and they provide lumber for building materials and also for, for firewood. That is to say, this keeps the villagers from going into the native forests and cutting down endemic species. On the other hand, the Park Service has to be very careful to be sure these don't get to other parts of the island because they are fairly competitive. Now, other parts of the island are in pretty bad shape. If you go to the easternmost port, a point of Robinson Crusoe Island, Puerto Frances, a lot of eroded areas. This sort of whitish area in the aerial photograph is all erosion. And you can see here on the ground, the what's left of the forest of uh, Nothomircia fernandesiana, but the rest is just uh, is gone. From a conservation perspective, this is pretty challenging and it's not clear whether it would even be worth trying to recover an area like this. It's just too far gone. <clears throat> Now fire has also been important and historically there have been a number of major fires that have been documented. Some of these are accidentally set and some of them are deliberately. The one I like is in 1849, 20 of the California 49ers that were going to the gold fields set just for fun, the whole uh, valley behind Puerto Inglés on fire. Well, you get toward late summer, you get a lot of these grassy areas. Many of them are introduced species now, but they do burn and uh, they just decided it'd be fun to see what had happened. Some of these fires may really have affected the vegetation in these valleys, particularly in Puerto Frances. But in any event, uh, there are documents that this has been an impact. A recent fire in 1996 occurred on Alejandro Selkirk Island. This came from a fisherman's campfire that just got out of hand and it burned 70 hectares. When we visited this island in 2011, you could still see some charred trunks of some of the tree ferns, but most of the vegetation had recovered. <coughs> in addition, you've got a lot of invasive species. Many animals and plants have been introduced to the archipelago, and some of these have become very aggressive, causing a lot of harm to the vegetation. In fact, there are more than 200 species of invasive plants that is more than the native and endemics. I mean, if you want to take on more than half of the flora of the archipelago consists of these introduced species. The four worst uh, plagues are these. The blackberry, Rubus ulmifolius, that comes from the Mediterranean region of Europe, was brought into Robinson Crusoe Island deliberately in 1935 for food value and also to serve as a natural fence to try to contain livestock. Unfortunately, these fruits are liked uh, or loved by not only humans, but birds. And so these, uh, uh, these, species, uh, these fruits have been dispersed all over the island. Another one that also has edible fruits, although much smaller, is Aristotelia chilensis and the Iliocarpaceae. This thing is native to the Chilean mainland where it's kept in check somehow, but here it goes wild, particularly in the lower, more moist ravines, forming these dense thickets that are so dark that nothing can grow underneath. An interesting herb is Acena argentea and the Rosaceae. This species um, is very aggressive, asexually and sexually. It produces runners on the surface of the soil. And it also has fruits in these uh, fruiting heads that have hooks similar to what you find on Velcro that adhere to clothes or to animal fur. And as a result, can just be dispersed so easily, taking over areas like you see on the right side. Now, from a conservation standpoint, this is a bit of a problem because the species does hold the soil. So if you're going to try to get rid of it, you better have some kind of replacement that's going to be effective. And a fourth one is Ugni molini, another native species found in the continent. 
This thing is a shrub and forms dense patches, patches such as seen on the right side. Now you, you can get through these and there are a few species that can grow mixed in with Ugni molini, but it's very aggressive. And there is an endemic congener, Ugni selkirkii, that grows up at about 700 meters on Robson Crusoe Island. And this, uh, this invasive is going higher and higher and competing against it. So it, it is a serious problem. As far as the feral animals, the most damaging has been the goat. At the present time, there are at least 5,000 goats on the Younger Island. In terms of rabbits seen on the left, these are most abundant on Robinson Crusoe Island. And the estimates range up to 20 to 30,000 of these things. The Park Service keeps uh, shooting them, hunting them and so forth, but it just you know, doesn't make a dent. They reproduce too quickly. And in the center, you have sheep, which now are completely under control. But at the beginning of the 20th century, there was an effort to turn Robinson Crusoe Island into a massive sheep farm for commercial profit. And it was modestly successful, but, the, but these animals, more than 5,000 at that time, really ate the native vegetation. So as a result of all these activities, a lot of areas, particularly in these uh, port areas where ships anchored, have seen a lot of forest loss and a lot of erosion. Even in a place like Puerto Inglés, seen at the top right, you see a green area here. Well, the lower green area, this is all invasive species. The native uh, plants only begin with the, Myrcia, the, the uh, Nothomyrcia that you can see about halfway up. That's when the native forest finally uh, clicks in. But down below is just all uh, introduced species. So the present vegetation in the Juan Fernandez archipelago has resulted from both these natural factors and the impacts from humans during this uh, uh, 400 period, a 400 year period. And the impacts from humans have been particularly strong on the uh, on Robinson Cruz Island where you've had this village of San Juan Bautista. So, I mean, I think it's clear that if you're interested in processes of evolution in this island or in general in oceanic islands, you really need to understand the natural and human associated impacts on the, the system. And so over the course of 4 million years, these two islands have undergone much geomorphological alteration that'll have had a major impact on the processes of, of, of evolution and their products. So if you just look at the present spatial or ecological context, it may be very misleading in terms of inferring speciation. So here's an example. This shows the endemic genus Robinsonia, which is related to Senecio in the Asteraceae. And the distribution of these species now is up along the native forest in the higher regions of Robinson Crusoe Island. We know from genetic studies, these shown here, AFLPs, in a phylogenetic context, the species are distinct genetically. And so the appearance is that you have a group that's adaptively radiated and no doubt uh, allopatrically in different ecological zones. And anatomical studies by Sherwin Carlquist back in 1974 suggested that in fact, these species of Robinsonia, some of them at least, do have different ecological uh, uh, correlations or correlates. If you look at the leaves, there are some that appear much more adapted to moisture conditions and others to drier conditions. So it, it suggested that probably these species did originate through a process of adaptive radiation into ecological zones. But now I take you to one valley on Robinson Crusoe Island and there are three species of Robinsonia right in here in this very tiny area. There's a scale here of hundred meters. You have Robinsonia evenia, Robinsonia grassless, and Robinsonia thurifera, all here in very close proximity. And also the case for three endemic species of Dendrosaurus. So one could say, well, maybe this means that maybe these species originated in situ recently, sympatrically. 
Well, that's not impossible. But to me, a more probable explanation is that allopatric speciation and adaptive radiation probably occurred when the island was much larger and ecologically differentiated. In fact, if you really want to get at processes of evolution, you should be looking at the younger island that has undergone less modification. And the group to look at is Erigeron, also in the Asteraceae. There are six endemic species here, and they surely evolved in this island. And on the right in the map, you see symbols of these species, and you do see ecological differentiation. For example, you have <clears throat> Ridgeron rupicola, the circles found along the coast, I mean, really on coastal rocks. You have Ridgeron stucii found deep into these ravines. No, I didn't name this after myself. <laughs> this was named for me by one of my former students, Ugo Baldo Benito. Erigeron fernandesianus is found up in the middle elevations, and then you have this complex of Erigeron ingi, luteo viridis, and turicola that is still sorting itself out morphologically and genetically. But what you see is a pattern of ecological separation, adaptive radiation, and allopatric speciation. Now, ignoring aspects of historical ecology can really mislead you in terms of interpreting evolutionary processes. Now, I want to use this as an example. There was an article published in Nature in 2006 by Vincent Savalainen and colleagues. Now, uh, Dr. Savalainen is an excellent researcher. But they got very much taken by the fact that you have these species that appear to have evolved on Lord Howe Island, which is off the coast of Australia. And after this original report in 2006, their group, especially Papadopoulos, they have published a number of papers suggesting sympatric speciation, not only in Howia, this genus of palms, but in 20 species in seven other genera in this island. Now, to just back up a little bit, and br very briefly, sympatric speciation is a slippery business. I mean, how do you get speciation when things are together? Because for speciation, you need some kind of isolating mechanism that limits gene flow. Maybe you need a change in pollinator, or you need some kind of phenological shift. There are, there are cases in the plant world known, but it certainly is not common. And then you have the problem of, well, what does sympatric really mean? I mean, how close is close? Three meters, three kilometers, 300 kilometers. I mean, what is really together or separate? And these difficulties have led some workers to say, listen, let's not worry about these terms. Let's just study the genetic aspects of speciation. Well, OK, that's one way of looking at it. But Savalinen and colleagues have emphasized looking at sympatric speciation. Now let's look at this. Lord Howe Island is off the coast of Australia, and it is geologically dated at 6.9 million years old. In other words, it's an old island. It sure is an old island. It's now small. It's 14.5 square kilometers, and it's almost underwater. In fact, the estimates from Savalainen are that in 200,000 years, this island is going to be gone, subsided and eroded no more. And geological studies have been done on this island, showing that the original size was much larger. When it first came up, it had a quite large perimeter, as you can see in this diagram. And furthermore, to the south is what's called Ball's Pyramid, which is a rock that sticks up from the ocean. So it doesn't have much flora on it at the present time, but you can see it also at origin was a sizable island. So you had two islands that came up back six million years ago. And during its ontogeny, these uh, islands have been reduced to what you see now, particularly Lord Howe Island. Now, I want to emphasize, Savalainen and, and collaborators have done an outstanding job 
of showing the morphological and the molecular relationships among populations and species of Hawia and other genera in Lord Howe Island. I mean, this is all very interesting. But all of these investigations have been from the perspective of, of trying to understand sympatric speciation. And they have emphasized this as one of the best examples in the plant world. And they have suggested that it might be a common phenomenon in oceanic islands. Well, the reason I got involved with this that caught my attention, and, and I have an article coming out in the Journal of Systematics and Evolution in the next issue. I mean, it's not impossible that species evolve sympatrically. I mean, this could, could be. But if you factor into the historical ecology of this, the island ontogeny, it's more reasonable hypothesis that the two endemic species of Hawia and species in these other genera, such as Caprosma, Asplenium, Metrocetus, and so forth, evolved allopatrically at a time when the island was much larger and more ecologically diverse. So what they're analyzing now is not sympatric speciation, but what I would call sympatric survival. Now that's still an interesting line of investigation. In other words, being compacted and shoved more together, like we saw in Juan Fernandez, how are these species maintaining their integrity? That, that's, that's a legitimate question. But it isn't documenting sympatric speciation. So trying to pull all this together here, the take home messages as you go home and on Friday night, open up your bottle of wine or your beer or whatever you prefer. Oceanic islands are dynamic ecosystems that undergo substantial landscape changes during their ontogeny. This is really the new perspective on looking at islands. In fact, some of you might remember the earlier uh, island biogeographic uh, equilibrium theory of MacArthur and Wilson back in the 1960s, which emphasized size of island and distance from source area as being fundamental for understanding diversity. Well, those are important, but that model didn't take into account the ontogeny. There is a new model, model by Robert Whitaker published in 2007 that goes along with our thinking too from the previous year that you have to take into account the ontogeny. These islands are just different. And, and this is really important if you're comparing islands of different ages. If you're looking at levels of genetic variation in an island that's 4 million years versus one that's 1 million years, you're going to see different patterns because things have changed during that time. So for a meaningful interpretation of processes of evolution, it's important, I'd say essential, to understand the historical ecology that has led to the present distributional and ecological patterns. Uh, seeking these sorts of, of uh, answers to infer evolutionary processes also are best done in younger islands. I mean, if you're gonna pick a place to look at this, don't pick Lord Howe Island, pick something like Alejandro Selkirk Island, one million years, or one of these very youthful Hawaiian islands that have been less impacted by natural and human factors. Folks, it's been a lot of fun. I'm more awake now than I have been a long time. It's exciting. I love to talk to you. I wish I could see you and wish we could interact. But I want to thank all of you there in India for your web attention. Okay, Arun, it's back to you. Marun. Hello, Arun, are you there? I'd be glad to take questions, but
हेलो अरुण हेलो यस कार कैन यू हियर मी या नाउ देयर वाज सम प्रॉब्लम विद द इंटरनेट कैन यू हियर मी या या ओके यस लेक्चर इज ओवर वेरी गुड यस यस हेलो यस thank you professor is to see for wonderful presentation about the uh, oceanic islands how ecology uh, historical ecology is important and then now we know much more about the uh, evolution and the speciation and also how the invasive species have uh, created problem uh, for the uh, indigenous flora in fact uh, uh, many of the participant So they might be interested that uh, how did you get interested in working in the goan fernandez island because you were in the ohio state at that time or earlier to that you were interested in island biology so uh, how how you get interested in that uh it's sort of a longer story but i'll give you the short version of this um back in the 19 70s can you hear me arun is it clear yes yes, yes. Uh, now back in the 1970s i had been working in mexico and central america and so i wrote to the organization of american states in washington to see if they might have some money for our research you're well familiar with that <laughs> <laughs> and and so uh, they said well we give money but not to americans not to people in the us we give money to people in latin america but here are the names of a few people who do things along your research line and maybe they would want to collaborate with you so i wrote them and one of the respondents was professor mario silva from concepcion chile so he was enthusiastic and we were able to get some money where i could go down there in 1977 to talk to him and our first idea was to work in the high andes because obviously you know that's a, a fascinating ecosystem and a part of the country but for various reasons our attention began to shift toward the islands the juan fernandez islands are a chilean national park and they had not been investigated evolutionarily by anybody and i had i had just finished reading the book by sherwin carlquist on island life you know emphasizing these natural laboratories and how how fascinating they are for getting at evolutionary patterns and processes and that being on my mind and realizing that we had an opportunity to work there i suggested it mario silva was enthusiastic and the other botanists in the department agreed so that's how it started and we've continued ever since that time yeah so it would have been very interesting when you first visited the island and since so many years you have been working on the archipelago now you might have observed that some of the island as you mentioned in your lecture that uh, some of the island they are uh, disappearing slowly slowly new islands may be coming so have you observed anything about that how this um, any emergence of the uh, islands in that area new islands well the hot spot right now is west of the younger island about 100 uh, kilometers So the hot spot is still going and there is a seamount that that can be observed under the surface of the sea but it hasn't appeared above the surface yet. If you look more anciently at at the situation to the east there are seamounts that could have been above the surface of the sea millions of years ago. it's hard to know because there's no evidence of any terrestrial life on them although it hasn't been looked at very carefully so what we can say is that the in terms of any additional islands either now or in the past there might have been but as far as we know that didn't impact 
the diversity of species in the present islands. Some of the questions we are getting from the participant that there are a number, a large number of endemic species are there in the archipelago. Now, what efforts are being made for the conservation of those endemic species, whether the species are being taken for ex situ conservation or in situ conservation efforts are also being made? Yeah, this is a this is a good question. To give you a perspective, four fifths of the endemic vascular flora is threatened to highly endangered. In other words, 80%. So you're talking about a flora that really is under a lot of pressure. Now, the, the Park Service is very aware of this, and they have published various uh, uh, plans for development of conservation beginning in the 1970s. They know exactly the situation and the data on the endangered status of these endemics is, is very clear. But what they lack, as always, everywhere is money. <laughs> they just don't have enough funding to be able to implement all these things. And uh, I mean, all we can say is, you know, they, there are many other national parks of Chile. This isn't the only one. And so, you know, the system can only do so much. Occasionally, international funding becomes available to help, but it's never been of a sustained nature. But that, that's really the challenge. Uh, the awareness of, of what's happening and how to do something about it is right there. It's just that not enough money has been available to implement all of the ideas. Yeah, great. So we, we have a question from the, uh, Dr. Anjar Kuru. He is in Kashmir, Himalaya, in Srinagar. Uh, and uh, he has uh, asked, uh, in fact, there is a problem of internet and other thing. So I'm asking question on his behalf. Sure. Uh, can human-led processes uh, equally, can human-led processes equally facilitate speciation as the natural processes? Can human-mediated processes? Yeah, yeah. human-led so processes. Equally yeah, that, speciation as the natural processes, because in nature it is speciation yeah. going on. Whether human activities may also uh, affect the speciation in the islands. I presume he's getting at uh, genetic engineering of one kind or another. Uh, well, I mean yeah. theoretically, sure. So but how, how this anthropogenic activity? A lot of anthropogenic activities going on because a large number of tourists are visiting those archipelago. And also there is a tsunami and there is a, also fire, invasive species are there. So how this, uh, all these activities are affecting the vegetation and local flora? Well, yeah, I mean, they've had a, a major impact. There's no question. And uh, this is why the flora is really so endangered. I mean, there, are, there are a number of conspicuous examples that there's, there was a sandalwood species that was completely extincted. Yeah. During, you know, during the big sandalwood rage in, in the 19th century in the Pacific, this came also to Robinson Crusoe Island, where the species was, uh, was endemic. And it was cut until it just became extinct. And the last tree was seen in 1910. So the humans just took that out and it's historically documented. Uh, another serious impact was on the endemic palm, Wania australis, that uh, was fairly common originally, but the sailors went after this because the apical meristem, if you cut it out, makes about two kilograms of edible vegetable. If you boil it up, it tastes like a cabbage. And so, but to get it, they cut down the whole tree. They just chopped it down. So this really reduced the distribution of this endemic palm. You only find it now on the higher ridges. It didn't, it didn't get extinct because there were enough plants growing in very inaccessible areas and the sailors couldn't get them all. But yeah, there have been some really direct human impacts that you can document. The, the sandalwood is the most dramatic because that was a clear 
clear extinction due to human activities that's very, very well documented. In fact, there's a photo of the last plant, the last tree, before it too was sacrificed. Uh, there is a question from Professor Rajesh Tandon from University of Delhi, Botany Department. And he asked about what is the extent of reproductive isolation uh, among the in the among the sympatrically evolved species in terms of their preference for pollinators. Are there natural hybrids among them as well? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, and I mean, on Robinson Crusoe Island, <clears throat> there are some phenological differences that keep uh, species isolated. That's one important point. But to, in terms of the pollinators, there aren't many insects in the archipelago, very depauperate. You do have hummingbirds being important pollinators, but more importantly, as shown by studies by Gregory Anderson and colleagues, is pollination by wind. And so it is hard to imagine why there aren't more hybrids among some of these species that are growing so close. Again, there are flowering time differences in some species pairs, but not all of them. Nonetheless, you don't find many, uh, many hybrids. There are a couple cases, but in this archipelago, it's just not common. If you get over to the Hawaiian Islands or the Canary Islands, hybridization has been very common in uh, uh, between species in the endemic flora. Yeah, and there is another question that uh, your talk focuses on oceanic islands. But how applicable is historical ecology to understand evolutionary processes in plants of continental regions? Yeah, also a, a, a good question. It's, of course, uh, historical ecology is important to consider anywhere on the planet. And as we know, humans have had a major impact on just about every square inch of the planet. And I don't need to remind you in India of that fact. I mean, you've, you've got a long history of a lot of people uh, doing all sorts of things. So if you're in an area, you really got to consider the, the human impact at minimum. Now we are a little better off these days because we have more ecological information at our disposal. I mean, I mean, years ago, systematists and ecologists didn't talk a whole lot. I mean, systematists have always said, well, ecology is so important because we wanna know the habitat and so forth, but, but that never got carried to, uh, to, to much of a detailed level. And it wasn't until databases of ecological information became available that allowed us to see correlations between those data and the distributions that made a big difference. And then entered the software packages, these you know, uh, uh, bioclime and other sorts of, of uh, software that uh, make hypotheses about not only the present environmental parameters, but past going back thousands and in some cases millions of years. So that now you can look at the spatial distribution of, uh, of, of, of species on the landscape and get inferences on how the landscape might have been changing and the ecological parameters which could have impacted what you're seeing today. And then you add on to that all of the new population genetic molecular techniques that allow you to see the patterns of genetic variation over the landscape, this phylogeography. So you wrap all this together and you have much more powerful insights than we ever had several decades ago. So yeah, I mean, if you put all this in the context of historical ecology, the, the, yeah, there's a lot that can be done. Uh, Professor Isusi, we are getting a large number of questions, but I will take last question because uh, uh, we, are, um, uh, we have a question from, again, uh, his Dr. Ratul Vaishya from the University of Delhi, again from Botany Department. That Professor is to see, did you, uh, did your finding follow any of the three theories of island biogeography, island size, distance, and species turnover? Should I repeat the question again? Well, I, I think I understand this. Uh, uh, certainly the size of the island and distance from source area as emphasized by MacArthur and Wilson in their very stimulating uh, hypothesis or theory back in 1967, 
of course, that it has to be important because you know the size of the island has to do with the target area for immigration, and the bigger it is, the more it's going to encourage arrival and also the possibility of of, of speciation. What MacArthur and Wilson didn't really get into, although they were aware of, was the ecological aspects of the island, because that's what has a lot to do with the development of species diversity. It's not just getting there, it's what you do after, you, you, uh, after you've arrived. And of course, they didn't consider the ontogeny, the changes that take place through time, because you can have an island that starts out pretty big, but after 5 million years, it's going to be pretty small. And all this has to be factored in, in terms of not only arriving, but developing and surviving in these oceanic islands. So uh, thank you, Professor Istusi, for uh, answering a number of questions. We know that in the uh, question answer, uh, we, we are in question. There are a large number of questions we are getting from the participants, but it is uh, not possible to take all the questions. Um, for the participants, I would like to inform that uh, when Professor Istusi visited uh, India for attending Indian Association for NGOs from Taxonomy uh, Conference as a keynote speaker, and he was at that time Secretary General of the International Association for uh, Plant Taxonomy. And uh, with his efforts, uh, IAT became the affiliate member of the uh, IAPT. So that was the first uh, organization we are uh, fortunate that because of the efforts of Professor Istusi, our uh, Taxonomy Association could become uh, an affiliate member of IAPT and also uh, regularly we were getting grant support for the conference and also uh, workshops. And uh, secondly, I would like to tell that uh, the, uh, this from this year onwards, we have already um, uh, started, uh, instituted a medal in the name of uh, Professor Todd Istusi. Uh, by the East Himalayan Society uh, Officer Metro Fight Texona. So uh, we, uh, we have uh, already circulated and we, have, we are getting the um, uh, biodata and nominations from uh, many of the practicing taxonomists. So uh, we are fortunate to have with, uh, that uh, Professor Istusi um, from the very beginning during his visits as well as even if he's in US and uh, Austria. He has been very uh, helpful to us in our all academic activities. And we uh, thank you, Professor Istutsi, for very informative and very lucid and very, uh, it, it was a wonderful lecture on the um, island uh, biology and his speciation. And I am confident that the participants must have been benefited by your rich experience of the um, as a researcher uh, in the island um, bylaws. Now, on uh, behalf of the uh, Chancellor of the Mansurwar Global University, Mrs. Manjula Tiwari, Pro Chancellor uh, Engineer Gaurav Tiwari, and on my own in behalf, uh, I thank Professor Todd Istusi for sparing his uh, valuable time, accepting our invitation uh, to deliver uh, a lecture, um, which uh, we were uh, awaiting since long. And at the same time, I um, thank uh, Professor Dr. Manju Sharma from the National Academy of Sciences India for her uh, continuous support and encouragement uh, whenever we are doing any academic uh, activity. I thank all the participants uh, who were with us. Uh, we, I know that uh, many of the participants were uh, on YouTube, because uh, many a times because of the internet problems and connections, uh, if they are not uh, um, on the internet uh, directly on their uh, PC, or, um, they were on the YouTube. So, and we have got a number of uh, mail, uh, mail from the participant, message from the participants, and uh, on uh, behalf of all the participants, I. Uh, congratulate Professor Todd Iskusi for his wonderful presentation. Thank you, Professor Todd Iskusi, uh, being with us uh, today evening. Thank, Thank you, you to you for all of your wonderful organization, as always. It was a lot of fun, and I was honored to be able to do it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.